let me just get a couple of things done so I don't see in the spotlight for everyone. All right, here we go. So good afternoon, good morning, good evening to all of you. Once again, I'm Grace from the Quantic Engagement team. I am a program experience lead here and um, I'm all about the experience and the events and the student support. So um, myself and my team, we are always trying to find the next best thing to bring before you. Um, Quantic students and alumni, welcome to today's session. If you could um, put in the comment box, let us know where you're calling in from. It's always so fun to see where all of our audience members are coming from and I always like to see as well. So go ahead and use the comment box and also let us know if you're drinking anything. Beverages are always a topic. So warm water, Hamish has cold water. We argued briefly about this, but yes, tell us what you're eating or drinking. And um, so we've gathered an awesome panel of thought leaders and industry pioneers for you here today. Um, and actually we connected, <clears throat> I connected with them via Javier right here. You see him also in our audience. Um, and Jordan, yes, Jordan is here. Um, always love our connections and conversations, which lead us to meeting cool people and interesting people. So that's how um, that's how it is that we have this event today because we have conversations. Um, <clears throat> now, before we begin, just a reminder for all of you in the audience to keep your audio muted in the session. Um, as um, myself and the panelists will be uh, holding the session. And I also want to remind you to think of this event. Yes, it's an event, but kind of think of it as a pop-up community. I just made up that phrase because it, it's, it's a time where we're all gathered for this hour. And it, it's a time that we want to kind of really activate the curiosity and meaningful contribution. And Quantic Students alumni, I, I, I know you well, you are all inquisitive, curious, and just really wanting to learn. So definitely have that mentality of community. And feel free to use the comment box. And I also have the Q&A function working right now. So if you click Q&A, you can submit questions. And throughout, um, we can, um, we'll check the questions and see which ones we can answer. We may not get to all of them because we actually do have a lot of things that we wanna chat with our guests about. So um, that's that. And let me, before I move on to the, to the main aspects, let me just see, does anyone, are we all good? Just double checking, give me one moment. Okay. Hello, Grace. Um, yes. This is one of the interpreters. Would you mind um, giving co-host stability to the interpreter so we can spell light ourselves for accessibility? Perfect. Let me do that right now. Thank you. Okay, let me know. Is it, do you see the co-host function? I do. And then the other, I see Christopher. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now co-host and then, okay, beautiful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Valerie. Thank you so much. All right, and I'm going to, Spotlight my guests. All right, here we go. So we have two awesome guests with us today. First, we have Utkarsh Goyal from Investment Banking to co-founding Hot or Not, I love that name, by the way, a cutting edge decentralized social media platform. But Karsh has a knack for spotting opportunity and turning it into successful entrepreneurial ventures. His previous projects included the edtech startup VR1.ai and the VR-driven hospitality solution Teleport showcase his innovative approach. And joining him is Hamish, a Cambridge University mathematician turned software engineer whose interest in efficient cloud-based systems led him to co-found Open Chat. This trailblazing chat app quickly reached a $20 million valuation. Hamish's experience also includes designing a new B2B hotel search engine for Emirates, showcasing his ability to bring innovative solutions to diverse fields. These two distinguished panelists are here to share their insights on the fusion of technology and entrepreneurship. 
without further ado, I am so I, I've been talking long enough. I'm so excited to introduce our two guests. Um, let me give you both a moment just to um, maybe introduce yourself a little bit more and say hi to the audience. Why don't we start with you, Hamish? <clears throat> Hello. Um, yeah, thanks for inviting me here. Um, I'm Hamish. I I work on a, on a thing called Open Chat, which uh, some of you may have used, but probably not many, but it'd be good if, if you all did. Um, you can find it at oc.app. Um, there are three of us currently building this. Um, we're trying to basically make it a fully featured chat app, much like WhatsApp and Signal and all that. But um, the key difference is that it is running on a crypto system. It's running on the blockchain and it is owned by the users rather than being owned by a single entity like WhatsApp is owned by Meta. So Meta will be harvesting all of your data for their own benefit. In the open chat case, there is no controlling entity. So um, yeah, I guess we'll go into more details later, but um, I'll, I'll leave it there. Yeah, that's great. Awesome. All right, over to you, Akash. Hi, uh, thank you so much again for inviting us over here. It's great to be in this event. Um, I am working on something called Hot or Not. Uh, we are building something very similar to TikTok, uh, but on blockchain. And uh, where we are differentiating from TikTok is essentially uh, by including or inculcating an element of gamification with TikTok. So not only is the user able to spend their time watching videos on the platform, they can also earn rewards for participating in the platform. So much like, uh, you know, as Ham uh, Hamish said, uh, moving towards a user-owned or a community-owned platform rather than one entity or one uh, single uh, uh, person or, you know, company having a majority of the stake in the platform. So, yeah. Right. Uh, you can find us at hot or not dot yes, thank you. <laughs> Excellent. All right. And um, this is this is great. And be so before we go deeper, um, and let's take a moment and step back to kind of set the stage and really kind of frame our understanding because our audience uh, is a range of understanding of the technologies that you're both talking about. So could each of you explain briefly, pretend we're 10 year olds. I, I like to use that as a, as a way to set the, the mindset. Pretend we're 10 year old children and briefly explain what decentralization, blockchain and web three are, any combination of that and why they're important for um, entrepreneurs to know about. So we can go uh, Utkarsh first. I'm your 10 year old daughter. Okay. Explain okay. to me what decentralization and blockchain and web three are. So um, in a very simple uh, you know, manner, if, if somebody explains blockchain, it is, kind of like, you know, there's a group of people in a room and let's say one person says that I have so-and-so information and it distributes, let's say he writes it on a piece of paper, it distributes pieces of paper to everybody in that room. Now, in a blockchain, everybody just stands up and collaborates what the original person said. So let's say if there are 20 people, those 20 people will stand up, show their chairs and say that, yes, this is the same thing that the original speaker said. Thereby, you know, taking that... Uh, not only does it help you understand or uh, get that initial data in uh, stone, set in stone, or you know verify the source and the validity of that initial data, um, it also basically gives the control to the community. So if the community does not, or if the if everybody in the room does not agree to uh, you know what the original speaker said, that stands nullified. So for uh, you know that uh, data or that conversation to hold true. Everybody in the room should agree to what was said by the original speaker. And that is where, you know, that conversation will flow. So that uh, really is something, uh, you know, very different. Now, where it, where does the word Web3 comes from is, you know, as we transition from the web. So uh, the Web1 was the era of, you know, static pages that we had way back in 80s and 90s, wherein, you know, we had just simple static pages, wherein you just had links to other pages. And you could not alter the information as you go or according to the user. Then came the era of Web3, Web2, wherein, you know, the web evolved a significantly more. And now we are on to Web3, where now the control is getting decentralized from, so, you know, singular entities on the top to the users or the community owners, um, you know, uh, community members, not the owners, community members who are participating in that ecosystem. So that is where, you know, the term Web3 comes into play for us. 
Over to you, Hamish. Yeah, what, what, uh, Professor Hamish, what can you add to that <laughs> to uh, explain more? Uh, def definitely not, Professor. Um, <laughs> so um, may maybe one thing just on the Web3, what you were talking about. Um, I've heard someone describe Web1, Web2, Web3 in quite nice terms, where Web1 is as a user, you read the content. You have no control over it. All you can do is read it then web two is you can write the content, things like YouTube. It is, it is user made content, but then web three is you own the content. So it's kind of like read, write, own. And so what the, what the two of us are building with open chat and hot or not is, is web three where the users themselves own the service, they own all their data. There's no one, um, Kind of, um, if we take open chat versus like the WhatsApp example, WhatsApp is free because you as a user are the product. Meta, the parent company, they are able to see who you're messaging. Your messages are encrypted. They can't read your messages, but they can see who you're messaging, where you were when you messaged, at what time you're messaging. They can build all of these friendship networks and and use that to kind of target different things at different people they can use it to influence regions they can at a large scale this is really really useful data for just having influence in the world mm -hmm. for them not for you as a user it's for them mm -hmm. whereas in our case there is no data being gathered because there is no one to gather the data it's just a protocol running out there like if, if you've heard of TCP IP, how the internet runs, it's just a protocol out there. No single person owns it. Essentially, open chat is just the same. There is no entity, there is no single entity owning it. All of the users just have a small share and it, it just runs. It's just running in the ether. I don't mean Ethereum. I, I just mean in the world. It's just out there. Um, and so it's, it's a cool concept, you know, it's, it's very new. Um, and, you know, we'll see, we'll see if these services take off, but um, yeah, I think it is a good way to shift away from all of these big players like Meta and stuff. Um, thank you for that. I, I <clears throat> when I chatted with uh, you before the session and um this a lot of this is new for me i so in my brain I, I i guess i operate in the web 2 world still like my my whole paradigm of how the world works is what we've kind of just live every day and with our technology so the um, even hearing the idea of going from a read mindset to a write to an own the ownership part the shared ownership part is still kind of mind blowing to me and i think the will be really as we have our discussions and, and questions and, and two of you share your answers we're going to get a lot of insight on there's a it's a huge paradigm shift too i feel like it's two universes in my mind i feel like there's the universe that i i know and then there's the one that you and akar are talking about um so i think um yeah that's just something in the back of my mind and it's it's fascinating actually um and it's also knowing and understanding the things that we are using like the Facebook the metas and the all the apps that we use I think at least for me I'm not fully aware of what is actually happening and that when you said that I'm the product that was actually really yeah kind of mind-blowing to hear all right so I have a question I'm going to kind of uh, switch around a little bit um but Karsh, I'm going to start with you your journey from investment banking to founding three startups is quite compelling what key lessons have you learned from these transitions that you can share with our audience it's a tough one uh, <laughs> so um I think uh, two things that uh, you know you, you learn on your uh, journey as an entrepreneur is uh, one being absolutely okay with uncertainties I mean Anywhere, uh, not just with the entrepreneurs, right? Everybody or anywhere in the world, we don't ever are going to have access to complete information before we make a decision. So it's always a trade-off between the time and how quickly you make a decision and how much information you have. 
So as an entrepreneur, obviously you shift towards the spectrum where you have practically minimal information before you make a decision and you know you you then try and adjust it accordingly because there's a lot of uncertainty with basically what you're doing and how you're operating and you learn very quickly how to adjust yourself to that uncertainties and adapt to the shifting environment. So that I think is one uh, lesson that uh, really entrepreneurs are very nicely drilled into uh, that you have to be uh, okay with dealing with uncertainties. And then the second lesson is that you just got to push it, push through it. There are going to be obstacles and, you know, either you find a way around it or you climb over the wall, whatever works. But the only thing that, uh, you know, will get you to the end is when you keep on going. You have to keep on going. I think pandemic is one event wherein, uh, you know, this uh, was illustrated in a very nice manner for practically all the entrepreneurs across the world, especially the smaller ones, right? Where we had... so. Before the pandemic, no people had worst case scenarios. That worst case scenario never included the revenues simply going to zero. There were, you know, worst case scenario would may mean that maybe the revenue would decrease by 30%, 40%, 50%. Nobody expected that there will come a day wherein just the next day your business halts completely dead in its tracks. Right? So, but then obviously there are people who, uh, you know, sail through that, emerge victorious and are doing wonderfully well now. Right. So the companies who actually managed to sail through those tough times, now they are actually reaping the benefits of those one or two years that they spent in the downturn. And, um, you know, even the, the the major thing I think that most of the startups at that point of time did was to keep their head down and build because that is the best time you can, you know, invest in building uh, during a downturn. And that is what most of the entrepreneurs actually resorted to. So that is where, you know, that great or that, uh, you know, um, that willingness to just keep on going, 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 keep on doing whatever you're doing every day uh, till the time you reach where you want to reach. Uh, that is, again, one very important lesson that actually, uh, you know, this journey has taught me uh, over the last four or five years. Yeah. Thanks so much. All right. And actually kind of uh, piggybacking off of the traits that are important and whether you discover them along the way or you kind of had it hardwired into you uh clearly the uh, founders and entrepreneurs of uh, startups have have certain qualities that probably would be really helpful to have um this is for both of you um what qualities did you look for or do you see in your co-founders um did, did you look for for co-founders and how did these qualities help in shaping your startup's vision in the blockchain space um Hamish, why don't we go with you on this? We'll start with you first. What were you looking for? Yeah, so um, Open Chat is built by myself and two others. And I, well, the three of us actually worked together in our old company for, I think, about eight years we worked together. And um, we, we knew that we worked together really well. And the few times we'd considered leaving to go and do our own thing but the right thing never quite came along um but then when we heard about the internet computer which is the crypto platform that open chat and hot or not is built on um and we were offered a chance to build on it and get a bit of funding to do so we immediately all quit our job our manager was not happy and um we started building building open chat and um i think in terms of the things we looked for i mean we we'd worked with each other for so long we knew that we worked well together and we we had the skill sets that we needed in order to make a uh like a, a chat app um we we are lacking in a few areas like we aren't exactly great at marketing um we're we're there's three developers so we're we've got that side of it covered um but you know things like um just dealing with the community pushing us pushing the service out there just marketing everything is definitely the next thing that we need to sort out but um we recently did a fundraising we did what's called a decentralization sale and um we raised some icp that way icp is the native currency of the internet computer blockchain and we can use that to grow the team now so the next role we fill will definitely be a non 
developer but it, it's hard to find the right person um and i think it'll be especially hard for whoever joins because we've worked together for 10 years now and having three people who know each other really well work together really well it's going to be hard so um i mean i guess i can't really answer your question all that well because i we haven't had anyone yeah we haven't had to look for other people yet right we the three of us work together and we kind of got a bit lucky in that we were the people that we wanted to go and build this with um but in the very near future we will be looking to grow the team yeah. So maybe ask again in. <laughs> That's fine. And you know what? Uh, questions don't always fit the situation. So, uh, but the just hearing about the um, the the origin story really. You started with three three of you who knew and trusted each other, and obviously had skill set. Um, but now this next phase of growing, um, what is it you're going to both need and look for in, and how to kind of um, weave that person or people into your existing team, which is um, really, I'm sure, challenging and exciting to think about. All right, Utkarsh, if you want to, if you have, if, if there's a situation where you can answer the question or even just um, what do you look for in people or what have you, you have, okay. you have plenty of experience. So, <laughs> so uh, team-wise, I think I completely resonate with uh, what Amy said, you know, again, we have uh, the, the three of us who are building uh, hot or not. Uh, we've been together for the last eight years now. So we know each other in and out. I mean, been through three ventures. So you practically, practically see all facets of personality of the other person during those up, upturns, downturns, and whatever is in the middle. So yes, definitely, uh, you know, uh, trust really goes a long way. Uh, are you able to trust the other person, uh, you know, blindly, practically blindly with whatever he or she is doing? So that I think is a very important uh, trait that you look for in a, a co-founder and not just a co-founder, actually, the early employees also, you know, fit into this bill because the first uh, five or 10 hires that you pick up, they are equally important to the business as the co-founders are, uh, you know, in terms of building the team, building the product, or even building the culture for that matter. So uh, this basically extends to the first, at least the first 10 hires that you do in your team. Uh, you know, how do you uh, get somebody in? And obviously, as Hemi said, it's difficult for somebody who's coming in from outside to just fit into the team, uh, you know, especially for those people who have been working for, you know, the last whatever, five, six years or eight, 10 years together. And we know each other very well, right? So it, it's practically, I don't even have to talk to my co-founders at times, but then they know what is supposed to be done or what, uh, you know, the other person is thinking. And where do we take the product to or the company to? So it's a tough, uh, it, it's, I think the, perhaps the most difficult job, uh, you know, of building a company, how do you hire the right people, especially the key ones, uh, you know, in the team. And it's always a, you know, trial and error. If you obviously make some mistakes, there's no perfect way to do that. So there's no perfect recipe to do that, actually. Hmm. Um, I mean, anything to do with humans, right? It'll never be perfect. So <laughs> um, thanks so much for that. I am, let me, let me come back to Hamish. Um, so you, you just talked about it. Uh, you're, you you all raised a oh. tremendous amount of uh, funds recently. It was exciting. And I think it was something in how many hours did um, did the did the fundraising happen within? You reached a certain point. What was it? Yeah, so um, we, we launched um, an, a, a token called yeah. Chat, Chat Token. And the the people who hold those tokens can vote on changes to the open chat service. Okay. And that's the only way that changes can be made. So before we did that decentralization sale, the three of us on the dev team, we had full control of the service. So when we wanted to push out an upgrade, we would just run a script and the upgrade would happen. Whereas now any change we want to make rather than directly making the change we have to propose the change and then people who hold the tokens can vote on the changes whether to accept it or reject it and only if the change gets accepted will it be made and so um oh yeah so regarding the sale um yeah. so yeah we sold 25 percent of the total supply 
um, for 1 million ICP. So a total valuation of 4 million ICP, mm -hmm. which I think is about 20 ish million dollars. Um, so we raised about $5 million and yeah, it was in about six hours, I think. Um, it, it was the sale started at about 6 30 in the morning for me and um when we woke up when I, I woke up and i saw like the first few minutes and it went crazy for the first few minutes we were about 70 percent of the way there after about three minutes um but then it really just trickled out it kind of plateaued um but then i think the americans woke up and then suddenly it, it went up again um were you surprised <laughs> We so we had um, we were allowing up to two weeks for the mm -hmm. sale, um, and we thought it would take a bit longer than that because we actually had some bits that we wanted to kind of. We thought we would have more time to prepare, but the fact that it finished in six hours meant that suddenly we were like, "Oh, we're we're now <laughs> live and we don't have control anymore." But it was all it was all fine. Um, it's it's actually been really smooth. Nice. Um, we were quite worried because we're the first team to do this, like, um, hot or not, we'll be doing it very soon, I think. And, um, but as the, as the first team to do it, it was, you know, we're treading on the untrodden path. We didn't really know what was going, what it was going to be like, but it's actually been, it's been really good. So, yeah. That's amazing. I didn't realize we, uh, you were the first, um, um, what do you, so well, congratulations, that's, that sounds incredible and exhilarating. Um, what is, what, why do you think the response was so sudden and, and so like, yes, get me on this? Uh, well, what is it telling us about just the, the market in general? Or what are your insights on that? Um, well, I think, I think in a way we were quite lucky to go first. I think the fact that we were first helped us. Um, maybe maybe we would have still raised the 1 million icp even if we weren't first but i think the fact that we were added more hype um you know people wanted to be on board with the the first one to do this and you know i think the next few will hopefully do well as well because people will have looked at the first one and thought oh look that's gone successfully and so they will have more confidence going into the subsequent ones mm -hmm. um but when you look at the big messaging apps like WhatsApp and Signal and Telegram, they have billions of users. They're worth hundreds of billions of dollars. And so we, have, we don't have billions of users. We, we have about 100,000 users. And, um, but those users really enjoy using the app. Um, yeah. We know we have a, a, people who are using it daily. Um, we have people who have moved a lot of their work chat over to using open chat. Um, and so I think there were enough people who could see the potential that um, we were able to raise that $5 million. And so there is still 50%, 52% actually held back, which can be used for future fundraising if we need it. So, you know, we didn't want to sell too much right now because it could be that in three years time, we have a much higher valuation and then we can do a bigger fundraise to help grow the team further. Mm -hmm. Goodness, thank you for sharing. All right, well, Utkarsh, well, first of all, I didn't, I, those are things that I, I wouldn't have known. So it's, it's so, so great for us to kind of get the inside version of what has been happening with your startup and also just where it, the journey that you're going on. So uh, Utkarsh, what, what's going on with hot for hot, hot for not hot or not? <laughs> um, whatever you're what, what's what's coming up for for um, your yours as far as raising capital. So, um, you know, obviously, as uh, Hamish said, open chat was uh, the trendsetter uh, in the IC ecosystem for uh, decentralization sale. Uh, we are also looking at uh, the same thing over the next, uh, maybe in the next month or so. So we are already in preparation for that, uh, you know, looking at uh, going decentralized, so to say. So uh, as far as the platform goes, we have completed, almost completed the base value proposition that we were looking at for the project. Obviously, uh, in terms of the roadmap, we are still a very long way 
from uh, you know where we want to be. But then um, we have completed the waste value proposition for the project. We're getting some wonderful okay. response from the communities as well right now. So we feel that now is perhaps the right time to hand over the control to the community and then get them along to build, uh, uh, you know, to build the platform going forward. And that is where uh, we're looking at the decentralization sale next month uh, for the project as well. Um, so fingers crossed, let's see. Uh, even if you're able to replicate uh, the success of OpenChat, that will be really, really great for us. I'll be yeah. buying some. <laughs> no, definitely. There you Thank go. You so much. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much. All right. So, um, and thank you also for kind of I, I explaining along the way what ICP is and tokens and just for those of us who are not in that universe to understand what those uh, terminologies mean, just basically how things work in, um, I guess, the blockchain world. Um, let's see. How do you, so this is, this would be for both of you. And I do say I do see some of the questions in the Q and A box, and I'll, I'll try to get to those. Um, how do you see the future of entrepreneurship in the blockchain space, especially considering regulations and control in the global north? Um, why don't we start with? Sorry, I'll. I'll uh, why don't we start with Hamish? Go ahead, you go first. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I think it's a lot more accessible as in say you were doing a normal uh, startup where you had a team based in some country and you wanted to get funding to grow your team to expand your service it would be very hard for you to get funding from anywhere other than just your local community you know your your country you you wouldn't be able to get like I wouldn't be able to invest in a startup in some remote country or not easily anyway. Um, whereas if you build on the blockchain country doesn't mean anything. You're just, everyone's the same. doesn't matter if you're in a remote village in the middle of nowhere versus the middle of New York, it, it's everyone's equal. And I think that's good. Um, in, in our case for open chat, we had 2,375 people who took part, who, who invested in our decentralization sale. And we have no idea where in the world they were, um, but, but they were, they were everywhere. They, it could have been, I'm sure there were people in America because the, the final kind of push of the last 20% or so all came when basically America woke up. I think China and Europe was probably awake when the sale started. And so the, the big burst at the beginning was probably China and Europe. And then the final burst was America. But regardless, um, just building it on a system like this just means it's everyone's equal and everyone can get access to funding all around the world. I, th I think it's a really good just door opener for people everywhere. Thank you. Bakash, thoughts on, on this? So, uh, yes, obviously, uh, you know, getting into uh, the blockchain space helps us transcend geographies. As you know, Hamish said, we are not restricted to one geography and you don't go in a sequential manner. So, for example, let's say I, if I'm based in India, I am not going to be like I'm going to start off with India and then move to other geographies and other geographies. So, even if I have to, let's say, give the example of what or not, right now, uh, we're getting... Over the last six months, we have gotten users from, I think, 168 countries. Anybody can just log on to Hot or Not or WTF and they can enjoy the app irrespective of where they're based and, uh, uh, you know, what they're doing or where they're coming from or where they want to go, whatever it is, irrespective of their personal, you know, background. They can just come onto the app and enjoy the app. Uh, on the flip side, however, the regulations are something that are really, really uh, a gray area right now because uh, there are countries who are pro-blockchain. There are countries who are not so pro-blockchain. Both of them are okay. But then there is a third set of countries who don't even clear their stand. They have absolutely no regulations around blockchain. Now, that is where it becomes a challenge because if you have regulations, you still figure out a way to basically either you want to operate in that country or you don't want to, or you want to deal with them or not. But if a country does not even have regulations around blockchain, that becomes a real challenge. You don't even know 
how do you navigate that area? Uh, that being said, I think this is something that the countries or any government across the world will not be able to ignore for so long, for too long. I mean, they will have to either accept it or reject it or take a stand at least on the, on the blockchain area, on the blockchain or crypto arena uh, very, very soon because it, it's going to burst out. I mean, uh, I think the problem that uh, we, we typically see from, uh, why we see a lot of pushback from the government agencies is uh, in the blockchain space or in the decentralized space, uh, you know, as we've said, there is no single controlling entity on top. The users are the people who are there on the platform are the controllers. So that because of that, uh, there is no way you can actually control or, you know, say that this is right, this is wrong, this should be there, this should not be there on the blockchain, right? So that is what I think uh, is uh, daunting for a lot of government agencies. They're too used to being in power and being in control of everything that uh, now when the control is starting to slip away from their hands, they don't really understand. They're, they're lost as to what has to be done in some places. So yeah, because even with, uh, you know, for example, even in the US, we are seeing a lot of pushback on the crypto projects. We have seen a lot of uh, the major crypto exchanges pull out of the US market just because the SEC is not that, uh, you know, uh, accommodating or uh, welcoming for blockchain companies. Right, the regulations are uh, the government is just stacking everything against the blockchain company. So the regulations are definitely something which uh, you know a little relaxation or even a little certainty in that area would help uh, as far as the operation is concerned. But uh, that is just one area. I mean, a apart from that, it presents you with practically unimaginable opportunities. Obviously, we start off with uh, replicating a lot of these Web two projects in Web three. But then Web3 in itself has use cases which are practically not possible in Web2, right? So once we get to those things, that is where the game becomes very, you know, interesting and entertaining because that is where you start seeing some things or uh, projects or value propositions which are completely new and completely novel. Yeah. So though we have started to go on those paths with some projects, we're still a very long way from, you know, exploiting blockchain to its fullest extent. Mm. Um, <clears throat> what you just said right now is really interesting that um, starting off, when, when I guess there's a need to shift the world to another understanding of how basically how things work, um, kind of like the paradigm shift I was talking about. So uh, both of you have <clears throat> have products that that are we have a, we have a version of it but that we're all we all know that we're comfortable using. And you you're creating your version of it um, in block on the blockchain on the chain. Is that the phrase now? <laughs> um, so the question that Sachin had, and that's what I'm, I'm thinking about too, is um, getting people to make the choice to want to use your product versus what we know already. Um, Sachin's asking, what strategies or approaches do you believe are most effective in overcoming the initial hurdle of attracting enough users? and building a strong network effect. So yeah, how are you going to get those of us using WhatsApp and TikTok? And I love TikTok, I'm obsessed with it. So um, yeah, what are those challenges and strategies you have? And let's start with um, Hamish go first. Yeah. Um, so one thing that if you're running on blockchain, you have at your disposal that you wouldn't have if you were, web two um is that you have a big bag of tokens that you can distribute to early users or just ongoing to um users who are having a positive effect on your service and then those users are more incentivized to spread the word among the people they interact with because they are literally invested in the service they are they are co-owners um and so you can get the network effects that way if if um especially if these people who hold the tokens see like the price going up everyone gets hyped and they'll tell all their friends and um so that that's one 
advantage, which uh, to be honest, is probably the biggest advantage. You can just use the network effects of people spreading people essentially become your marketing department. Um, we haven't had to we we really haven't in open chat pushed the marketing that much we're we're hoping to um we're building a thing called communities and that's what we're really focusing on right now and once we've got that done we want to then try and bring on people um we'll be targeting like people building projects primarily on the internet computer at first just because it will be an easier sale to them um and and so we would we would try and bring these people over from maybe they're using discord almost everyone is using discord everyone building a service will be will have their discord server and we want to really make it just so open chat can be like a drop in replacement for discord so we're building that functionality right now it will probably be done in maybe 2 months 6 weeks um and then once that's done we're we're really going to try and push the marketing so yeah we'll we'll see creating ways for it to to build the, the community piece um right now we, we basically just use twitter as our um yeah. we just tweet but obviously that doesn't really get us much outside of our existing following yeah yeah so yeah we we need to we need to do better in this regard all right, but Karsh, what are your thoughts on this? So, uh, I think communication, marketing communication is something which is very, very important. Uh, you know, when you're marketing a new project or a new approach to uh, the users, you, uh, as, as a project, let's say for building, who's building an internet computer, we did get a lot of support from the early adopters uh, or the early uh, users from the ecosystem as well. So that way, we've been very lucky, uh, you know, in getting a lot of support, significant amount of support from the ecosystem in growing uh, the project to where it is right now. Um, but when you actually start challenging the Web2 alternatives, see, uh, as a user, when somebody who's using the platform, a general user, they're not, uh, you know, concerned about whether you're building on-chain, whether you're building off-chain you're hosted on AWS or you're putting all your data in the sky, they don't get, they don't really care. Uh, what they are concerned about is the user experience, uh, the usability of the app. So as I think uh, developers of, or the custodians of the project, uh, of the Web3, it is our job to make sure that the user experience is at least at par with whatever is offered in the Web2 space, if not better. Till the time we are not able to deliver an at par experience, it will become a very uphill task to draw users in from Web two to Web three. So, for example, let me let me very take take a very quick example of emails. For example, right. So, people are we've, all of us are practically using Gmail right now, and we are used to that uh, the fact that you know once I click on send on my Gmail, uh, the receiver will receive it practically instantly uh, uh, on the other side. Now, what if I build a service on Web3 where if you say if you press send, you'll have to wait for let's say 30 seconds before the receiver receives it. Now, even though the user is very excited about using the Web3 alternative, they will soon get bored because the experience is not that good, because the experience is lagging. So till the time you're not able to get them the same experience, if not better, it will be an uphill task getting out, uh, for a project to keep on growing and continuously attract users. Uh, that being said, um, there are there is a very uh, you know big chunk of people who are now concerned about things like privacy and you know control and data where it is going and uh, how is my data being utilized. So obviously that forms a very uh, lucrative uh, initial audience for the blockchain space because those are the things that uh, you're you're targeting directly uh, as a blockchain project. Uh, and then with tokens and everything, you know, rewarding the users, that again becomes an incentive for getting the users on board because you're practically handing them money uh, for participating in the ecosystem. So that becomes another uh, motivation for the users to come on board. Uh, so what we have to understand as developers is getting users on the platform is one thing, but retaining them on the same platform is something 
is an entire uh, you know entirely different ball game altogether so you can get as many users as you want but if you are not able to retain them it's a effort down the drain for you mm-hmm. yeah um yeah and the, and we're just in the the world is just going to continue to have more and more and more options so um the the challenges that business owners face is just increasing increasingly more um i have a question um in the in the web3 sp- or no in the blockchain space and you can tell i'm not 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 of a technical background but um from a technology point of view is there more possibility and potential to build greater things in the web, in the blockchain world than there is in the, what we have now is it is a difference are there more a po- more possibilities we can't imagine so some yeah i'll i'll leave it there um hamish i hope you understood my question i think i think i'm kind of is this universe better than this universe <laughs> yeah um it all has trade offs so um open chat and hot or not they're both running on the internet computer which is just one of many blockchains i think it's the best but um that's my biased opinion um when you want to make a change to state like for example if you send a message or on hot or not if you like uh if you um vote something as hot that takes about two seconds for it to confirm so if you were building in web 2 not on the blockchain that would be pretty much instant so it is slightly slower but realistically what you can do is you can you can build in such a way that the users never see this so in open chat when you send a message as soon as you click send your message will appear and you you you'll see a spinner until it's confirmed but you don't really care too much about that and if you're receiving a message if you receive a message 2 seconds late you don't even know you got it 2 seconds late cuz it's you know it, it might be an hour between every message um and what we've done to make it more um what we've done to just make it more kind of real time when you're chatting directly with someone is um, everything still goes via the blockchain, but we also create a peer to peer connection, which means that, so if, if user A is chatting to user B, every message that user A sends will go to the blockchain, but it will also go directly to user B. And so when they're chatting, you can see each other's messages instantly. And you can see things like the the other person is is typing noti- the little like dot 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 the other person is typing notifications, so we can still do all of this, which make it essentially just as responsive mm-hmm. as if you're building on Web two. Mm-hmm. But then we also have the advantages of us building on the blockchain, so we we can kind of work around some of the issues introduced by the added latency the added latency is low it, because you know with bitcoin when you send someone some bitcoin it takes about an hour for it to confirm then along came ethereum and with ethereum it takes about 10 minutes and then there were hundreds more chains got created and you know they're getting more and more advanced and the internet computer is now i think the most advanced one out there and so now you have two seconds where you can you can send a message and it takes two seconds you can store data you can store a gigabyte for five dollars a year which is nothing versus what the other chains have um but yeah because anything you build it's only going to gain users if it is at least as good as what's already out there Mm. And I think you can now do that if you build on the internet computer. You you can't do that if you build on Ethereum, because it just doesn't have the performance that you 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 just have to have. Users, some users will use it just because it's crypto, but ninety nine percent of people will just use whichever app is the best, regardless of if it is on chain or not. They will just use the one that they like, mm-hmm. and so you have to be able to compete with that. 
Um, we are um, just to kind of uh, frame where we are right now. We're, we're down to the last several minutes, and I want to um, put in a few more questions. By the way, the amazing questions, everyone. And in th as you can see, we can't get to all of them. Um, and and for me, my um, my takeaway right now at the moment is that there we're, we're talking about the future of entrepreneurship, but also just the future of technology and and basically how they kind of collide all the time. All right. So Chris's question is great here. Um, amazing projects. He's always been interested or found Web3 fascinating, but it seems so hard to get into. Any guides or resources from either of you or pointers to point absolute newbies uh, who wish to try to build their own mini Web3 projects? So advice from the experts to people taking a dip into, into the new pool. Um, Udkarsh, what do, you, what do you have for us? I think uh, I'll, I'll defer to Hamish on this one because he's the developer uh, okay. you know, uh, <laughs> who, who's already taking care of Web3s. So I'm not really a developer myself. So yeah, Hamish, over to you, please. Yeah, um, I'm just, I was just going to get the link. Um, but there's there's a page on the internetcomputer.org website that explains how you can get started. And the tooling is quite good now. Um, we've been building OpenChat for about two years. And when we started the the dev tooling was really bad and it was we'd we'd just be stumbling all over the place just hitting blocker 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 but now it's about as easy as if you're building just on web 2 you know it's got the, all the stuff that you would expect it to have um and there's guides and there's examples that you can look at to get started so you can you could build like a really simple app in minutes hours rather than days and weeks excellent oh yeah someone's just posted oh that, that's okay <laughs> all right excellent now i have a question for see see we're, we're living the community right now you see all the stuff going on everyone's helping each other out and asking great questions um but Karsh, could you share with us how AI is incorporated in your processes to improve efficiency and what impact you see AI having on competitiveness of entrepreneurship? Okay, so um, AI is something which has been around and it's, it's nothing new actually. So it's been around for almost a decade now before you know it actually burst onto the scene uh, with uh, you know the gpt is coming into play now um uh, they obviously have uh, a lot of advantages if used right so it's like any other tool that technology provides us right it is on to us how do we take advantage of that or how do we leverage that so uh so for example as a project right for hot or not now one very important thing when you're building a short video app is uh personalizing the videos or the feed to a particular user and that is where, you know, AI plays a major, major role for, uh, you know, refining that feed completely and refining that engine that basically predicts what kind of videos will a user like and what has to be shown to a particular user. So that is one area, obviously, where we are already inculcating, uh, you know, artificial intelligence into the project uh, for Hot or Not to personalize that experience for each and every user who's coming on board. Now, the advantage that we get right now uh, with, you know, obviously AI bursting onto the scene is, so TikTok and Facebook are already using, uh, you know, AI to do these things for their users. However, it took them almost a decade uh, for, for TikTok, for example, it took them almost six years before they're now, the, the AI is now refined enough for them to be able to predict or suggest the videos that it suggests. You enjoy your experience on TikTok because of the kind of videos that you're able to see. Right, which is where the AI is working, uh, you know, around the clock uh, to suggest that kind of content to you. The advantage that a pro new project like us gets uh, over perhaps TikTok with the with the advent of GPT is that we can use Chat GPT or other GPT uh, tools to build an AI which is almost as good as TikToks in just maybe a couple of months, rather than spending years training and. Uh, improving that AI to get to a level where it is right now. So that is because these, for example, ChatGPT has access to data from across the world right now. Practically almost everybody is using ChatGPT for something on the other, and that is just improving that AI more and more 
making it more and more efficient. So that is where the advantage uh, comes in for us, for something like us, uh, for something like Hot or Not, where we can simply take uh, use the AI to generate better engines and integrate them directly into the app without uh, you know spending a lot of time training that AI and building those engines ourselves in-house, right? So that's obviously an advantage. And overall, uh, generally, if I have to say, um, in terms of AI, obviously it will help us. It will make uh, a lot of things very easy. For example, especially things which are uh, mundane, mundane or the so-called grunt work that has to be taken care of, uh, you know, where it's repetitive tasks that you have to keep on doing. So data entry and inputting or uh, basically, you know, just cleaning up everything. So those kind of things will become significantly easy wherein you can, you know, you plug in the AI and get your work done significantly faster uh, than waiting for humans to, uh, you know, complete that. So as I said in the beginning, it's, it's a tool. It depends on how efficiently are you able to leverage that uh, or do you allow yourself to become obsolete because that technology has come up. So the same goes with blockchain, for example, right? It, it, uh, it is dependent on the stakeholders across the world as to how they adopt blockchain and uh, into their overall uh, business or their overall business model and alter that or take advantage of blockchain. Or the other alternative is that they can sit on the sidelines and get obsolete very quickly. Mm. So the choice is always on to the users, uh, you know, um, where they want to be in the curve, whether they want to be ahead of the curve or they want to be left behind. Mm. Um, and and uh, my last question to both of you, we're down to the last two minutes and also kind of going uh, a little bit with what you just said, Hamish. Oh, no, sorry, oh, gosh. Um, Broadly and widely speaking, and of course, based on your experience and what you're seeing in the world, um, what what should future entrepreneurs or or even current ones be paying attention to and watching as we go into the future? Because it feels like everything is happening very fast. So I guess, what advice would you have for someone who's thinking about entre uh, starting up a business and what to pay attention to. So what should one be paying attention to with the future in mind? Um, we can start with Udkarsh and then Hamish. Okay. Oh. I know these are, I know these are big questions I'm asking you. What's one, <laughs> one thing that you would recommend people pay attention to if they are considering starting a business? So, uh I think one uh, very important trait of an entrepreneur is the ability to adapt very quickly to the things that are coming in uh, in their environment. So that is where, uh, you know, uh, this I think fits very well into the question that you have uh, just put up in terms of what is the future of entrepreneurship looks, uh, looks like. Mm -hmm. So with, uh, you know, obviously so many things and technologies coming up uh, and so fast, uh, it's very important for an entrepreneur to understand which of these technologies or which of these things that they can take advantage of when they're building a business. And that would also require significant pivoting in their own business model as well. Because sometimes what happens with entrepreneurs is that we become too stubborn with what we are doing. We, we tend to lose sight of you know what the user wants or perhaps whatever is out there can we improve that. We just get single-mindedly focused on a single track that we are taking, and uh, which is a good thing also, and which is a bad thing also. Mm -hmm. So you have to prevent it from becoming the bad or you know the evil in your journey. Uh, and pay attention to everything that is coming in and see how you can leverage that or incorporate that. Uh, if you can incorporate that, and then how you can incorporate that to make a product or offering significantly better than what it is right now, right? Because at the end of the day, uh, as you know, he said, the user is 99% of the users are interested in using whatever is the best. They don't care about the underlying technology. They don't care about whether it is being built on blockchain, it's built, built on Google or whatever it is, right? Mm -hmm. They are more interested in what experience they are getting onto the uh, from the uh, application or from the product. And hence, it is the job of the entrepreneur to basically uh, you know, look at what can be fitted in uh, to make their offering 10x or 5x or 10x better than whatever they're offering right now. Mm -hmm. Such wisdom. All right, Hamish, um, what would you, what, what would your insight be or advice if there was even one thing to share? 
Um, so many. <laughs> you, I, I think you have to build something that people want, mm. that people will use. There's, you can build an amazing product, but if no one wants it, no, if no one's going to use it, then it's never going to succeed. I think now that the whole Web3 movement is there, you can almost just pick up something that's big in Web2 and just build it in Web3, which is kind of what the two of us have done. Because everyone in the world uses a chat app, but there's also a lot of people out there who really care about privacy and really care about who owns their data and more so now you know that's that's growing more and more all the time and so i think building when what we thought when we were starting open chat is we just thought this was ripe for disruption because if we can build a service that is as good as what's already out there if not better and has way better privacy and giving the users data ownership then people are going to come flooding flooding to it and um you know that's that's our goal and same with hot or not they're basically trying to build a product that is at least as good as tiktok but with just much better guarantee guarantees of data privacy and data ownership mm -hmm. but similarly there's loads of other big services that everyone uses where if you can build basically just the same thing but build it on web3 platform and give users that ownership, give users those privacy guarantees, then you'll succeed. That's nice. All right. And on that note, I will just leave you a quote from Field of Dreams, the movie. Um, if you build it, and I guess if you build it well, then they will come. Um, wow, that was really cheesy. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much, panelists, for, for your wisdom and sharing your journeys with us. Audience, I hope you got some inspiration from their ideas, probably no, no doubt more questions as well, but um, that's what we're here about. We're here to really, really push that curiosity engine and, and get all of our students thinking about what their next best thing is going to be. So I bid you all farewell, have a good night, um, afternoon and morning, and we will see you at the next meetup. Thanks everyone. Thank you so Thank much, you. everyone. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Great insight.